everyone on this Thursday evening, even though the internet thought it was Tuesday evening. We're not even going to talk <laughs> about that. <laughs> and less, welcome. Said about less said about that, the better. None of us noticed until the 11th hour. Yeah. <laughs> My sister in Germany notices. <laughs> But we're definitely Thursday. We definitely weren't here on Tuesday. So um, unless we're doing some sort of time slip, always possible. So welcome, Marcus Tonnet. Hello. German, German born, studied in Dublin, living in Basingstoke. Yes. That's a that's a repertoire. Oh, that's <laughs> that's just what the tip of the iceberg. I mean, we're, I I I'm an Irish citizen. I I studied art in Ireland, and. Um, I lived in America, in upstate New York, just to watch the towers come down. And then we moved to Africa for a couple of years. And since wow. then, I've been living here. So, yes, wow. we've, we've got around. We've you're, got tra around. you're very well traveled. So it seems, yeah. And that's just where I've lived. I mean, I've traveled as well. I, oh, I, love, yeah. I love seeing countries and being there. My, my first culture shock was uh, Morocco. When I went, I was only a young teenager, I went, ran away from home to Morocco. <laughs> and, I think we'll get on to, we're going to come on to that in a minute. Right. So first of all, I'm going to do what I normally do, which is show everybody your page in the magazine. So right. everyone knows how to contact you. Because if they don't know how to contact you, then um, that's a bit, we haven't really done a very good job, have we? <laughs> so... As you're going to be listening to myself and Marcus chat about his inspiration and his life and his work and everything, I'm sure you're going to be massively inspired. And so you can contact Marcus by email. And he is on page 58 of the magazine. I'm sure all of you know where to find the magazine now on the website. But if just to remind you, it's under the Art360 tab, magazine. Click on that. You've got Marcus on page 58. Email, website, I'll do a quick show of the website in a minute so you're sure you know where you're going. And then Facebook and Instagram, all the artists have Instagram. So yeah, that's where you can find us, a little sneaky peek. We'll have a little chat about this piece in the in the image as well, because that's, that's got a lovely story as well to it. So we'll have a little chat about that as well in a minute. But that is where you can find Marcus and all his contact details. And then we'll just have a quick look at your website. So when people get there, they know that they're in the right place. I always think this is very reassuring that people know that they've arrived on the right artist page. So there you are, welcome to Marcus's studio. And a little hint about what we're gonna be talking about, your very unusual practice and how you came upon this idea. That's right, so yeah. there we are. So that's your website. And there's lots of different things on there. So you've got relief work, engravings, card cut sculpture, 2D work, and more. So have a good old look around. Oh, look, Pure Art 360 down there as well. Good man. Oh, yeah. I, I do what I'm told. I do what I, I do what I'm told. <laughs> no, I mean, what's, what's, what are these links for? But to link it all together. You know, if you've got exactly. the connection, you got to use it. And... Uh, yeah, right. make the most of the marketing opportunities. Because as we were talking this morning with Imogen from Hello Polly, it's all about how you link up around the internet now. It's not just about having keywords in your search, mm -hmm. but the algorithm likes to see you appearing on different people's pages and you mm -hmm. sharing things with each other. So that's what that's, drives the internet. That's why I thought when, when suddenly Cordula told me that it was advertised for Tuesday, I thought, oh, here's another opportunity to exactly. interact with it. You know, it probably does no harm to say it again and to have more people comment on it. And, you know, exactly. So. so we've got quite a few people live here with us. And if you're here with us on Crowdcast, please, can you pop your questions in the ask a question area at the bottom of the screen so that we don't miss anything? If you're watching us on live stream over on Facebook and in The Hungry Artist, if you've got questions, pop them in the comments area and we will come back later on and see those and comment and answer your questions. I, so, I'll yeah. definitely go look there and answer anything that I find. And Tessa's realizing. watching us. Yes, she is. So she that's always, good. She's always watching. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to hand the screen over to Marcus so you get a much better view of what's going on um, with Marcus's artwork behind. Because uh, no one wants to look at me anymore. That's 
we're quite overdone with seeing Leslie on a screen, I think, now in these days. Right. Beautiful clear screen as well. So that's lovely. You can see the artwork very clearly. So, Marcus, tell us, where did this all begin, the journey? Where did it start? Yeah, it's very hard to it's um very hard to pinpoint because I was born into a family of two artists. Both my parents were artists, they met in art school, they were starving artists of you know. And uh, they were pretty well known in Cologne um, for what they did. And, what, and I was just thinking, as I was thinking about this conversation we were having today, Leslie, I was thinking that um, what are the influences? My mother um, was very much a drawing person. She liked scribbling. She liked the idea of just scribbling. She didn't like the sort of drawing, fine art drawing idea, and, but she really liked the rawness of drawing, the immediacy of it, just make a mark, there it is, you know, no, and, and folding paper like a newspaper gets folded, you know. My father was much more of a, um, he, he died when I was 12, so I didn't get the benefit of him being around so much. Um, he was very into colors, he was a painter, he made three-dimensional things, but he was very much a painter and he uh, swooned over colors. I, I learned later from letters he had written, I mean, he really did. Um, and I must say, I didn't really get, make really good friends with color until much later on when I met Tessa, because Tessa is very sensitive to color. And although I learned the techniques of colors, the, te the theory of color, I tended to be very intuitive about it and quite loud. And I think I've just become a lot more sensitive to the colors and their relationships uh, as a result of knowing Tessa. Mm -hmm. You say your parents were starving, the quintessential starving artists. Did, yes. Was that their main jobs and did they make their living out of that? Well, that's interesting. I mean, um, my mother was quite proud in saying that uh, when I said starving, I mean, they made some money, but they weren't well off by any means. Um, not that most people were in the you know late 60s, 70s uh, in, in Germany. Um, I suppose people were like anyway, not not that I knew, um, but um, she was very proud that she had woven because she was a weaver as well, a textile uh, uh, artist to begin with, and she had woven both her driving license and her first car, so they were the result of her weaving that that she was oh, wow. able to afford these things. Uh, so in that sense, you know, there was a certain level of success there that she was able to do that. There were expensive items that she was able to ascertain, achieve because of her weaving. Mm. Um, my father was definitely an artist. He later became employed by an organization as a graphic artist. He wasn't terribly happy doing it. In fact, shortly before he died, he... Uh, sort of changed his employment situation with them, I believe. Um, he, he wasn't very happy to be employed. He was a free spirit and a wild wild card in a way. Mm. Um, yeah. Did they teach you art then? Did you Do you remember them sitting down and teaching you? Well, or were... they, that's not the way it went. It's more like, you know, because they were making art, we started making art and it was, you know, it was just assumed that it was, you know, of course they're making art, you know, that, and it wasn't sort of, Oh look, he's making art or anything like this. It was just it was just like eating or going for a walk, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember my mother encouraging me on one occasion when I, I there was a uh, someone had chopped down a tree in the garden and a stump was standing there, and I took an old root from somewhere else and strapped it on and painted it all up with, you know, poster paints. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother took photographs and was sort of encouraging that. That was a, a nice moment, you know. Um, also, we often talked. I mean, I did drawings, and I would always say, "I do it like this from now on." And my mother was always saying, "Don't worry about it from now on. You, you do whatever." You know, <laughs> there, there was a lot. There was a lot of uh, give and take. There were a lot of conversations about art. Um, it was um, it was just there. My brother wasn't that arty. I think it's more a lack of confidence. He was more a scientific sort of mind. My sister is also an artist. She works in puppeteering and she got inspired in, in Ireland when she followed me and encountered puppets in Ireland. That's another story. 
I love the puppet. <laughs> perhaps, but, perhaps you can interview her someday. <laughs> yeah, I love I love this idea of the fact that it wasn't you were didn't you weren't taught us. It was just the same as eating and mm. you know drinking. It was just part of your life. It was normal. And I remember uh, one of my friends. He's still a friend of mine, uh, Achim. Uh, he he asked me, you know, his father was. I can't remember, he was a, a tiler or a plumber or something useful and practical, you know. And he asked me very honestly, he said, what's the point in art? What's the use of it, you know? What's it good for? Because he didn't see the point, you know. It's, it's, why would someone pay someone to make something that looks nice? He looks at life different now, but it was, uh, we were surrounded by this, well, what's the point in art? And oh. And I kind of felt, how am I going to ever convince people or educate people around me that art is actually more important than most anything? If, if you don't have art, there's no point in eating or you know, doing all those useful things. Because in the end of the day, when you finish doing all that, you want to sit down, watch a movie or, or, or look at a picture or you know, enjoy something, something beautiful and, or something interesting or challenging or whatever. You know, and that's where yeah. art comes in. So you go through this very amazing growing up. Um, did you then, as a child, then go, and I want to be an artist when I grow up? Yes, pretty much. I, I never really questioned that. I, I was always going to be an artist. I, I didn't know what kind of an artist I was going to be. I, I liked film. I also really liked the idea of teaching. I did do a lot of teaching in my day. Um, so teaching was something I felt called to do as well. Yeah. Mm, mm. So what was your first medium? Uh, drawing, definitely drawing. And uh, pencil, uh, crayons, all kinds of making marks with, with the hard implement, mm. you know, with something, just drawing. I think drawing is the key. I, I really um, believe big time in drawing. I think drawing is thinking on paper. Um, uh, people who can draw can communicate. I remember being in Holland one day and I had been bitten by a guinea pig in my nose. <laughs> and I went to the doctor and he wanted to give me tetanus or something and he didn't know what had bitten me. And so he asked and he spoke Dutch, I spoke German. We had no way of communicating in a language that was uh, spoken. And he drew... A rat and i said no not a rat he drew something else and then he drew a guinea pig with just a couple mm -hmm. of lines very clearly understand yeah that's that's the one that, that's <laughs> who did it, you know? and, but it's like he could draw he was a doctor you know mm. and that's what, that was very interesting it's just sort of yeah you don't have you, to be good at it you don't have to be good at writing to write a shopping list you know you don't have to be leonardo da vinci but you should be able to draw something you know, yeah, make a on mark paper. on a paper. Make a mark and say, this mm. is what it is. This is a, a window or a person or something, mm. you know, guinea pig. Mm. Yeah. Is drawing still part of your practice now? Always, yeah. I mean, I'm if I'm on a, a phone call, I, I invariably end up doodling something. And while some people may not call that drawing, it can really turn into something and it can give you an idea for something else. Yeah. And again, the... The, the real attractive thing about drawing that coming back to what my mother was saying is the loose mark, the free mark, not the self-conscious, I'm doing this because it's meant to be this and such and such thing, but the freedom of a mark that almost happens by itself. There's a, if you look online, there's a lot great interest in people uh, pursuing accidental art, so-called mm. accidental art, art that isn't art because someone said, I'll make this with these colors and with these marks, but it just happened. And then the artist, I suppose, is the one that comes and sees and says, oh, look, that looks just like a painting or like a drawing. So the artist yeah. becomes the observer and the observer becomes the artist. Mm. Our brains um, are always working to try and make sense of it, aren't they? Mm. Yeah, That's sure. challenging to try and make sense of all of these things. So what took you to the next stage to Dublin and away from Cologne? Well, first of all, I stayed in Cologne for a while. I, I, you see this, this thing here. Mm. Is, can you uh, bring that forward? Yeah, I can bring it a bit closer. Let me just do that. Oops. I can get out of here. Yeah. Don't pull, don't pull anything over. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is 
uh, a photograph of a stained glass window, mm -hmm. which I designed in Glasmalerei Lauten. Uh, Fritz Lauten was a friend of my father's. They went to art school together. And uh, when my dad died quite early, um, he, uh, uh, Fritz Lauten sort of took me under his wing a bit, I suppose. Um, or at least he felt responsible for me. And um, I ended up starting an apprenticeship. I didn't finish it, but I did start it. I spent a year there in an apprenticeship. And um, this was one of the first things I designed and made there. Uh, so I would have been like uh, mid-teens, 15 or so, when I did that. And um, it was very interesting. This was kind of a first love. It was like where my raw inspiration met some kind of skill, some kind of technique. And um, I, I really did like it very much. Um, yeah, but it ended because I decided I it was all the whole uh, social structure around me, I felt was too tight and I needed to get out. So my friend and myself ran off to Morocco for a while. <laughs> and, uh, Sounds like you were channeling your father at that point. Yeah, a bit, I suppose. I mean, I just needed to be, I, need, I felt I needed to be free and I, you know, it was wild, you know, I'm, I don't recommend it particularly, but at the time it was the right thing for me. And uh, I, it's another long story that could, a whole story could be told about that, but I don't think that's going to further our understanding of the art. I think it was more interesting coming back from there. And then I did an apprenticeship, not an apprenticeship, I did a, a practical experience in a graphic place where I was doing learning how to do graphic. Still in Germany? Was this in Germany? Still in Germany. This mm. was the same place where my father had worked. There are also friends of my father. And they said, yeah, you can do a practical. And I got very little pay, but I got some pay. And I was doing something useful. I was up the, you know, I had some mm. schedule. I think that was important for me. I have something to do. And, um, and I remember during that time, a friend of mine that I went to art school with, um, Johannes, he he went to Ireland. He had, through his parents, he had connections with Ireland. And uh, he went to an art school in Ireland, the Dunleary School of Art and Design. And he'd mentioned it, and he went off to Ireland. And then sometime, I, I actually wanted to go to Cologne, to the art school my parents went to. I uh, did an exam there, an entrance exam. They liked what I was doing, but I didn't have the school school qualifications. So I wasn't permitted to go to the school, even though the school said we'd like him. Yeah. So then I applied to Ireland because Johannes sent me a postcard. And I said, ah, I remember Johannes went to Ireland. Let's check this out. I didn't particularly want to stay in Germany anyway because of military service. I thought if I could go to Ireland, I could become a, a, a deserter rather than a conscientious <laughs> objector. <laughs> So, so I, um, I anyway. Long story short, I applied to Ireland uh, to um, and went there. Did my entrance exams. Was very inspired by the school there. It was a very free spirit, very inspired, creative environment. Mm -hmm. And um, I did my entrance exam. Um, and then uh, I received a few months later. I received a thing saying, or weeks later, a thing saying that I hadn't passed. I hadn't entered. Oh. I wasn't. I wasn't going to Ireland. I was rather disappointed, but at the same time, I carried on. And um, I I got better. I just ended up saying, I've, if that didn't, if I didn't get in, I want to get in. I worked really hard. I spent that year doing this graphic stuff with the uh, company where my dad had previously oh. worked and carried on working on my portfolio. I did a lot of color work. They said there wasn't enough color work, maybe. And I did lots more drawing and, and really beefed up my portfolio and then I applied again and um, interesting thing happened that the the application I'd sent to Ireland was returned to me with a note on it saying that the school had to move down the road but instead of sending the application down the road they sent it all the way back to Germany by the time I got it back I had missed the application date so true, true to form mine was last minute you know and so, um, yeah, I, I rang up uh, Trevor Scott, who was the head of the school, and uh, got him on the phone. I was sitting opposite my graphic uh, mentor in, the, in work, mm. and um, my English was very bad then. I wasn't good at English back in mm. school. And um, so I got this phone call. I, I, I made this phone call to Trevor, 
And uh, he said, hello. And I said, hello. And I said, this is Marcus. Yes, hello, Marcus. Yes, uh, I, I explained. And he said, don't worry, just come. <gasps> wow. And, and uh, I thought, okay, thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. Boom. Hang up. And if, if Dingemann Prim, the, the graphic artist, hadn't been sitting opposite me, assuring me that, yeah, that was the way the conversation went. He said, yeah, just come. Just come means just come, you know. Yeah. And I said, maybe I misunderstood something. He said, you can't misunderstand, just come, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to Ireland, packed all my stuff and, you know, you know, went to change country, you know. And... Um, with very little English. Very little English, and also with a slight doubt that I might have misheard him somehow. <laughs> so it wasn't until I was sitting in the class with Trevor actually making eye contact and recognizing me and saying, there you are, that I knew I was okay. I was yeah. It's Marcus. <laughs> it's Marcus, yeah. Anyway, that was, that was Ireland. Ireland was a wonderful experience for me. Yeah. Um, so what medium was Trevor, what was his medium, and was he? Trevor, did he inspire you? Trevor was an educator. His main thing was art education. He was also a free spirit. He was the head of the school of the Lewis School of Art and Design. And um, he just wanted to help people be more like themselves, help people express themselves. So his whole education was about giving us a language and facilitating us with a language that we could express ourselves. There were wonderful exercises like they would give us a quote from something from some novel or from the Bible or from a magazine, just some a line that was profound in some way, you know, and then we had to go and illustrate it, or or they would uh, give us a fraction, just a tiny little square centimeter of a picture from something, and just say, okay, now first of all draw the same thing big, so you're yeah. drawing this tiny little detail big, and then the next one is now draw the rest of it. Imagine what the rest of it would look like, you know. And so we were really challenged to imagine. We had a great 3D teacher who later became a colleague, uh, or whose colleague I became later. That was, a, you know, he did the same thing. He wanted us to experience space and use space as a three dimension, as a material, rather than, you know, rather than thinking of it. You know, many people think of space as a shape with thickness. You know, mm. if you make a letter A and you give it thickness, mm. it's still just a letter A. It's not three-dimensional. It becomes three-dimensional when it's got three-dimensional components and it goes like a sphere. It's not a mm. circle, but it's a form. So we, we learned about these things. And it's very, to me, it was a real eye-opener and, you know. Quite conceptual. Yes, conceptual, uh, perceptual. There's a lot of perception. Mm. There was a lot of, we were asked, we, we experienced things with blindfolds and where things were, objects were passed around that we had to feel and smell and touch and then draw. Someone, Sounds like my teaching. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, I'm sure it does. And on one occasion, I remember clearly there was an onion that had been passed around and someone touched the onion, bit into the onion, smelled the onion and then drew the onion. And only when he took his blindfold off did he know that it was an onion. An onion, wow. But this seems like you were still quite in the drawing space at this point. Yes, drawing was still important. Oh, we did a lot of painting and, and uh, we learned about printmaking. We learned about all the three-dimensional materials, stone, clay, metal. Mm. It was a great, it was what a foundation course should be like, in my mm. opinion, where you mm. really get a grounding in all the skills and, you know, you don't get good at anything, but you get a taste of everything. I think mm. that's what a foundation should be like opportunity mm, it's yes. an opportunity isn't it foundation Absolutely. is an opportunity yeah. and it's a foundation on which we can build you, you can mm. go narrow you can go more specific mm. i continued to specialize in not specializing uh, as the politics of the school changed and by the end of my time there there was uh, another chap there who shall remain nameless because i haven't very much good things to say about him um and, if you have uh, nothing good to say, say nothing, say nothing. is what my exactly. mother would say. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, so I said uh, at the end, I was going to specialize in print, paint, and sculpture. And he said, you can't do that. We won't be able to assess you. And I said, well, that's your problem. You do your thing and I do my thing. Because from the education I'd received from the previous school mm. that was there, it made sense. Yeah. And I could defend it. 
whether I would win this argument or not didn't really matter, but I knew what I wanted to do. Mm. So I ended up uh, later, I learned from uh, one of my teachers who again later became a colleague. He said there were hour, hour, hour long arguments about whether they should fail me or give me a high distinction. And they ended up giving me a middle distinction, which I would have preferred to have been failed or given a high distinction, not given a middle lukewarm thing. But that's how it ended up anyway. But because learned, they just they couldn't fit you in a box. They couldn't fit me in a box, yeah. Mm, yeah, and they weren't prepared to make a, a special box for you, mm, no. which is always sad, isn't it? So well, from, from yeah. there you go on. Where did you go? What happened yeah, next? I well, uh, I did a little bit of... Um, I, actually, I was offered by a friend of mine whose father was a contractor to do a commission in stained glass. And I said, okay. I'll think about that. I did that. Mm. And uh, I did it. And they were very happy with that. And then they, he said, if you want to set up a stained glass business properly, I have lots of work for you. And at the same time, Robert McColgan, who was my 3D teacher in my school in the old days in Dunleary, uh, he, he said, would you be interested in teaching team teaching in the 3D core area in Mountjoy Square in the, new, in the Dublin Institute of Technology? And I said I would. So I ended up choosing not the business, but the education. I had really a choice of doing either. And the idea of just producing something for a contractor, nice and all that he was, for me, the education was definitely where the excitement was, you know, the question rather than the answer. Yeah. So you showed us some of your early piece, the early piece of glass there. Do you have any mm. other references from your early work? Well, um, for what I did for a long time, let me just, I I'm, I'm sort of have a chair here that lets me find it hard to get out. Um, I did for, well, just, I did a lot of painting and stuff. Um, so this is a painting that is of Trevor Scott. He is the head of the school in Dunleary. Hmm. Um, there's many other ones, but it just seemed relevant to show Trevor. Hmm. Um, because we've well, been I, chatting about him. He's such an, obviously it. a very profound influence on you. Yeah, on, on me and many other people. I mean, he's oh. a very profound educator. Oh. And um, But what I did very much do after I left art school, I became a found object artist. Um, I did a lot of things like this. Although this wasn't... It's in the style of the early stuff, but but the, um, the earlier stuff um, was often in boxes, more three-dimensional. This one was actually made in Africa. It's called About Time. And it is, um, yeah, a collage of different things. And did you find all these pieces in Africa? Yes, uh, all these pieces, except this, actually, funny enough, this thing here was in a drawer of a piece of furniture that came from England, which we happened to be there. And I, I found that I really liked the way it was corroded and became a background. I was always looking for backgrounds for these things. The frame is a, an interesting piece because the um, it's part of it. It's not a separate frame. It's, it's very much part of it. Um, it is, if I don't know if you can see it, but the, the marks are chainsaw marks. So when you go when in Africa, most of the lumber, most of the timber that you see uh, has this rough texture on it which is basically they just go in the forest, cut down a tree, and then cut it into planks there and then. So the marks are chainsaw marks. So I went and bought a piece of wood with these chainsaw marks on it and asked the guy in the place to cut these off for me. And he very nearly chucked them out. He thought I wanted, I wanted them gone and wanted the piece that had a clear, nice, smooth surface. I said, no, no, these bits are the ones I'm after. I wanted <laughs> but, to make yeah. a frame. So these marks, again, they're, they're accidental, deliberate. You know, I mm. like that combination. Mm. Um, there is an extreme piece here. When I say extreme, because where do you draw the line? What found objects qualify for, for a piece of art? You know, mm. this is a rainbow in a gilt frame. And um, it's just one you know the, the the picture itself is just one item it's one piece and uh, the frame is also a found object which I, I put a little mount on it but that's it 
And this is basically a floorboard that was uh, underneath the toilet bowl. Ah. So it, it, it is a rainbow in more than one way. But you see, there's no, there's no limits to what you can use, you know, as long as... Uh, That's incredible. So you found the frame as well, and you're like, okay, now these, frame, two, just, these uh, two are married. Yeah, exactly. The, the floorboard was a bit longer, but I was happy to chop a bit off to fit it in there. So, yes, finding things and making things out of fine objects, for me, was always a, a great joy. But it was also a limitation. It was I had grown so used to it that I started looking for other ways. I wanted to do sculpture. I did a lot of drawings for public sculptures. Perhaps I'll do them one day. I really love the idea of making something in a public space that is <coughs> large and you know interacts. I want I want things to share a reality with you, not just to be an image, but to be sort of take away the frame take away the pedestal and make it make it part of the world you're in already and so i i made a lot of three-dimensional things uh, as part of that i don't know if you can see this yeah this is uh sort of two two forms become one um oh, anyway that. that's uh that's that but um i also so yeah, so you you moved. You were doing the found objects, and you're doing the three D objects, and you're and, and you're teaching. And you're you're asking me what's the, your inspiration? I mean, mm -hmm. I was always looking for the inspiration in in the in life, in philosophy. Like I'm not trying to represent something so much as to re reimagine something, re uh, invigorate an experience, to warm up some emotion, or to conjure some memory or some thought that you haven't thought yet some conversation that is yet to come that's for me what what art is about is to to go into another space that maybe needs some exploring or that whizzed by earlier and that needs more attention so i started doing things like i made molds in concrete i did a lot of work in reverse where i made i took a sand bowl and i dug a hole into the sand and then filled it with concrete and then when you take it out you have a positive yeah. But but you're working in a negative, so your mind has to think, what does it look like in reverse? And it's very interesting when what comes out because it tells you how your mind thinks the eyes are much bigger than they are, or whatever, you know. Um, and were you making this when you were making this work? So this very conceptual work, the inside out and the found yeah. objects and the things that look like one thing but are actually something else. Mm -hmm. Were you making them? just for the conversation or were you making them for a commercial reason to sell them what was the what was the That's, motivation it's a very good question um for me it was um more like uh, a bird goes and makes a nest doesn't ask why just does it for me it was not a question of why it's like you know i haven't made anything in weeks i need to go and do something i'm starving I'm, I'm hungry for making another piece of art. I was that kind of starving artist. I, uh, you know, even though I spent my life doing, like Tessa and I did a project in Africa, we did, you know, philanthropical work and mm. we put our heart into it. But art was always something that I needed to explore and always something that I needed to go back to. So it wasn't because I made it for someone else, although I was always appreciating when other people could connect with it. It was something I had to do. Yeah, it's about your very essence, which comes about, through from what you were saying yeah, about your parents yeah. when they, you just, art was like eating and drinking. That's become it's so right, yeah. fundamentally ingrained in your life. Yes. So yeah. um, now, and, and this is where, where it, something interesting happened because um, just a few years ago, uh, I think it was for 2014 or thereabouts, um, there was a competition. I was always entering competitions. Of course, I hoped that whatever I was doing would eventually, you know, in the motto of you make a good mousetrap and the world will be a path to your door, that some at some stage someone would be interested in my stuff, you know. So I would always enter competitions and I'm more used than anybody to getting the rejection letters coming back um, saying, you know, it was all very nice, but this time you weren't included. And on this occasion, there was a competition for art 
uh, to express peace, world peace, peace, peace. And I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll go. I have a go at that. And then I thought about what I would do. And I thought it's a very tall order to make a piece about peace because it would end up, in, invariably, it would end up corny and obvious or so removed and so abstract that it's hard to imagine that it's got anything to do with the theme. So I said, I'll, I'll leave it. I'll just not do it, you know. And th the next morning, I was meditating. It's something, I, again, a practice that I've got into around about that time. And um, I meditated in the morning. And suddenly, in a real blank moment, I got a very clear idea of what I wanted to do in response to this idea of peace. And that was uh, a piece called Approaching Peace. Um, on my website, the edge is is of that piece. I'll explain okay. it to you. I'll explain uh, it to you. If if you want to see it, go to my website. Go on the Instagram. It's there somewhere. So at um, the bottom of the page here, we've got Marcus Donner Art Studio. If anyone wants to go and look at it now, it's on your home page. Okay. They can have a look anyway, at it there. What what uh, what came to me in this meditation is to use some of the plywood. I have bits of plywood in my garage. I have so many bits of material that one day I was going to do this and that with. And so I had, among other things, this plywood, and it was, I had this nice thick plywood, and I said, I'm going to cut a square, and I'm going to cut grooves into it, um, like like this, you know, like uh, holes and mm. uh, uh, sort of mountains and valleys. Um, and from the edges in, it would get... From outside it was rough and darker and it would get lighter and lighter and softer and in the middle it was just white and soft and and that was my idea it's actually i i don't think it's wrong that you meet this idea as an idea before you meet the piece because that's how i met it for me it was first oh. an idea and i said great and i know exactly what i'll do i'll use the my carving tool to carve these these you know um, centric lines that go oh. towards and it's going to be called approaching peace because peace to me was more of an idea at this point of something that you get more or less of. And on a good day, you might get a lot of peace. On a bad day, you might not get any. Mm. But it's like peace is, for me, wasn't the sort of idea of, oh, one day everybody is going to live in peace. I had, I'd pursued that idea but you know, in my life, but I'd gone away from that because I, I think just like a forest won't have all the trees at the same age at the same time ever, you won't get a consensus from, from the world as to what everybody should be doing. That's not going to happen ever. Peace, peace is going to mean different things to different people to at different, different people, times. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so um, to me, uh, the idea of approaching peace, some kind of, you know, peace nearby. Yeah, was, the journey. Some, yeah, I could relate to that. Anyway, the, the, the uh, submission was rejected about which I was quite happy later on because when I saw the first prize for this competition was a soldier with a tear in his eye. Oh, yeah. it, it was exactly what I had been trying yeah. to avoid making. Yeah. You know? um, so I was quite pleased I wasn't in there. But that's what started me off making these making these pieces. Uh, they're up in the... Mm. This, this one here mm. uh, is... Um, I don't know if that's uh, that has another interesting story because when I had an exhibition, I called it uh, I called it a beautiful day or something. Anyway, the, the, uh, another person said, I said, if you can give it a name that's better than that, because I wasn't that pleased with the name, uh, maybe that's what's going to happen. So this friend of mine who saw it and he looked at it for ages and then said it's a uh, uh, he he called it um, Sea of Tranquility, and so it became Sea of Tranquility. And I like that. I like when people come and you know complete the work by giving it a name. You know. Yeah. So talk to us about you've talked about how the methodology of actually creating the board, mm. but how do you apply the paint and how does that work? Because mm. you've got this one behind you that's quite iridescent. This one here. Mm. Yeah, this one is slightly different. Um, it's um, it's painted on corrugated iron. It's um, it's not painted on wood. Um, what I did is I took a piece of corrugated iron, and I 
rolled a heavy roller over it so that it's almost flat again. And then I just used a, a, a brush to apply the marks across the, across the texture. And so something similar to that happens with these wooden ones. Mm. I just pick out the colors, uh, the, the different textures with paint. And because something, um, I, I, I don't know why, but I don't really want painted marks in this. I want freer marks, much more accidental than painted marks. And so uh, I suppose this is, I remember having a conversation with you about this before, where how everything that you do somehow influences where you end up and what you end up doing. I spent a lot of time uh, putting bread on the table by painting and decorating and by gardening. And uh, when you are sanding down some old door, you suddenly see the history of that door and there's green and there's blue and there's yellow, all these different colors that this door might have been painted at some stage. And so for me, the idea of that kind of mark appearing was very appealing. I, so I basically did the carving and uh, then started painting over it. And in the case of approaching piece, I put a lot of colors on the outside and less colors on the middle and then just white over everything. And when I sanded it down, the colors were coming through in the rougher bits and they were coming through less in the middle and then in the very center, it was just peaceful, white, quiet. But if all of it was white and quiet, it, you know, why, why do we live in a world that isn't always peaceful? Because we want something going on. We want something happening. So, you know. You yeah, can... we were talking about this when we were saying it's like the paintings are like, an, uh, they like represent an evolution the evolution as you move through time and yes. and, and everyone's at a different a, a different level within mm. that evolution mm. and i totally see that i love the one on the corrugated iron i think that's mm. beautiful and i and i really love the mm. the carving with these as you say these accidental but quite mm. evolutionary yeah, yeah. created yeah. paint yeah. surfaces as well yeah. you need to get up really close to them if anyone is yeah. around the hastings area yes. They are cool. on exhibition at Bannantyne's Hotel and Spa in the gallery. And we've got quite a few mm. on show, including the two that are in the, on the magazine cover, mm. which is quite a funny story because yes. they're, they're, a, um, they're meant to be hung together and I hung them slightly apart. And so we had, they had a little row for about a week and now they're back. They've given them some therapy and they're back together now. Yeah, it was they, very they're nice. over it. It was very nice of them to have the row because it was, you and me were supposed to have the row, but we never were into it. We that, never so. did it. We don't do that. <laughs> we don't do rowing. We don't do rowing. So then, so, and then you said you had to do some counselling before I they could did. be hung back to, together. I did. I had to say to them, I'm terribly sorry, and I hope you know that this hasn't caused a rift that's permanent. And no, they're all they're yeah. absolutely fine, and they're actually in the restaurant now, and they're yeah. loving life in the restaurant. Yes, I'd say so. Yeah. I'd yeah, say they get along very very well. Yeah. Yeah. Overlooking I've, things. I've yeah. noticed that they. I mean, I'm. I'm. I can show it to you a bit closer, so you yeah, get that's an idea. Yeah, fantastic. Um, like there's real wood in there, and it's interesting because often people look at it and they say, "Oh, is it paper mache, or is it skin, or is it metal?" You thought. Do you remember? They were metal. I thought it was yeah. metal, didn't I? Yeah, I yeah. thought they were metal to begin and, with. Um, and so, and they, they, they sort of look very thin when they're on the wall because I've taken the the edge off the back. So when you look at them, they, they do look like they might be skin or they're sort of thin on the edge. Mm. And, and uh, have you thought about, and this is not a suggestion that you should, this is just a question. Right. Have you thought about, because the other two pieces behind you, you've got frames on. Did you think about the concept of actually encasing them in a frame? I'm very deliberately not putting them in frames. There is, I have one that is in a frame. I should really have it down here, but... Anyway, another time. Another um, time. <laughs> I knew from the beginning that we wouldn't cover everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, we haven't I'm, got three weeks. <laughs> yeah, no, no, or months or years. Yeah. Um, the, the, there's one upstairs that has a frame. And the reason it has a frame is because it was a circle, a big spiral, and it just didn't work. It was lost, this circle mm. with the spiraling. So I ended up cutting a section of it, which was the circle had the center in the middle and then the edge there. I can hear Tessa upstairs. She's, she's gone to get bring it, it down. She? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> she's gone like to get said, the She's always listening. She's always listening. Um, <laughs> We're not going to get away with anything, are no, we? No, 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 no. <laughs> anyway, um, the reason it had a frame is because it was suddenly, there she is, you see, 
Yeah, just, we I love Tessie. So Your <laughs> able assistant. Oh, damn. My, oh look my, at that. Sorry. So this is this is uh, the vortex of desire. Uh, Abraham wow. yeah. inspired. Yeah, Abraham so Hicks. You can see why this, if it was a big circle, it was lost as a big circle. Mm. It, as a piece, it didn't have any, no focus, you know. And by putting it in a frame like this, mm. uh, suddenly this off-centeredness of it and it, it puts it all in context. It worked for me. But that's the only one that I have. Thank you, Tessa. Thank you very mm. much. It's the I only think that's one. In, it's incredible because how would you feel if someone did decide to put them in a frame? Um, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be happy at all. I don't think they they work in a frame. But mm. For me, like what I said earlier, in a way, these are what I've always wanted to do, and that is combine the two dimensional with the three dimensional. This is mm. a sculptural piece, and yet it's essentially two dimensional. It's essentially a picture, mm. but it's not just a picture on a wall that's of something. Instead, it's a piece of material that shares the same physical reality as you. You can touch it. Um, it won't mind being touched because the last part of the process was a heavy sanding. You're not going to do any damage to it by touching it gently, you know, mm. unless you have just eaten a chocolate something. <laughs> um, do you varnish them? Do you put anything over them? Uh, to protect some them? of them I do, some of them I don't. It depends on the colors. Um, this one I didn't varnish. This one I did. If I varnish this one, uh, there is too much of the of the wood showing, and you varnish it, it becomes dark. So there would be too much brown in it, and I didn't mm. want it to be dominated by brown, so I didn't varnish it. Mm. There, there are other pieces. This, obviously, being metal, doesn't, didn't have that, so I didn't have to worry about it. It was just brought out the colors more. Mm. And if I do put a varnish on it, it's usually a matte varnish. Again, there's few exceptions, um, mm. but yeah, usually a matte mm. varnish. I like, I really like the idea a piece to share the same reality with you. That's why these don't work so well in a picture or in a video. But when you meet them, as you know, yeah, they're, they're they are different when you meet them. You know, they're, incre they're, they're incredibly yeah. powerful when you actually meet them in person, when you approach them. And it's a bit like that whole conversation around uh, nature and being in nature. And we are nature as we go into nature you approach these in the same as you say the same energetic space as yourself they're they are very powerful mm. they're, and they're material they're not illusion mm. they're not of mm. something they are themselves mm. i just spotted a little question we've there got of what some questions yeah we've got some questions so what am i sandra, doing at the moment yeah so first of all sandra says do you do the colors you use reflect your mood um yes they do uh my mood uh my aspirations, my hopes, my sorrows, sometimes, yeah, sometimes uh, different, very much emotions. Colors to me are very much about feelings. Mm. Absolutely. And you use a lot of blues and um, an orange as well, I've noticed. Yeah. It's very interesting that you should notice that. Um, for me, blue and orange are the most satisfying complementary color. Everybody has different you know, if someone asks me what's your favorite color, I say blue and orange. Ah, oh, there you are. Uh, See, look, I'm very observant. Yeah, and it's not <laughs> uh, one color, but it's a combination, the yeah. relationship. That's and you can have like the paints I use are not expensive paints. I don't use oil paints. I don't use acrylic paints. Sometimes I mix a bit of acrylic in to to tweak the color a bit. But I use emotions. I use household paints. Very often uh, discarded by a previous project or by the paint uh, shop who who mixed the wrong color and I got it for a few quid. Um, mm. And it's an interesting point. I know you were going to ask it uh, at some stage if you got a chance. That is the whole thing about recycling and yeah. environmental impact. Mm. My work is almost all of it is uh, made from reused, recycled materials. Um, and it's, it's not because I set out by saying, oh, I mustn't use artist materials or uh, I must preserve the air. I don't think I'm going to save the environment by getting a piece of plywood. You know, that one piece of plywood is not going to make the difference. But the fact that I'm not investing in acrylic paints or oil paints or all these thinners mm. means that I'm not feeding that. I'm, I'm feeding, I'm not feeding any of these things because I'm actually using materials that would otherwise have gone to the dump. 
And so it stays within your found objects kind it of stays part of your practice. The found object, yeah. So yeah. I really like that. I like the fact that something has a, you know, th that color was mixed by mistake. It doesn't even have a name, you know, and now it becomes a feature in fine art. It's been elevated from being the wrong product in household paints to being the right thing in a fine art project. Yeah. You know? yeah. And then. Fran is asking, would you say your artistic journey has been full of serendipity? Oh, I love that word. Serendipity is a great work, word. Um, it, it sort of implies that there is such a thing as accidents or coincidence. And I must say, the, the longer I'm around, the less I believe in coincidence. It's all meant. The things that happen to us, they happen to us for a reason. And we are as much part of creating that as whatever else creates these things. I mean, we, we are part of the creation, the creator as well as the creation, I think. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, yeah. The happy, the happy, it. the happy accident, but it, it's mm. part of the, it's part of, part of the purpose of mm. why we're here. It's like, you know, if you want to talk about creating something and s say you believe in God, you know, I'm not saying one should, but say you believe in God and say that God made the clouds. He didn't make every individual cloud. He just created the, the he or she or it created the environment where clouds happen. And there they are. That one looks like this. That one looks like that. And that's part of what you're doing. You're interacting mm. with it now. And I think mm. that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm creating an environment where, you know, yes, I'm choosing the blue and the orange and a bit of red and maybe a bit of brown or something completely different. Mm. But then what happens to these, I, I'm not contriving it. I'm, I'm a... I'm a perfectionist kind of person. If I was drawing, I would go right into all the details and I'd get lost in the details and then it's too small. I can't put any more details in it. I can't do that with these because the details already happened by the time I finished carving them. Now I'm painting them, sanding them. They are becoming what they're becoming, you know? Mm -hmm. So yes, the, the accident is very much part of that. Yeah, it's, it's part of the journey. Mm -hmm. And Sandra is saying, do you ever destroy any of your paintings? Yes. Yeah, certainly. Gleefully. Uh, well, no, the thing is, not everything turns out. And no. I remember I was, I remember on one occasion, uh, much to my surprise, my brother was outraged when I, when I broke something up that I thought was no good. And he said, I love that, you know. And I said, well, it's not, it didn't, as far as I'm concerned, it didn't make the grade. It wasn't up to scratch, you know. And yes, of course, if you don't think it's up to scratch as an artist, you should not keep it. I've seen exhibitions of famous artists and say, oh, this is his studio stuff, his sketches and everything. He may not have wanted to show these, he or she may not have wanted to show these. And so, yeah, if you don't think it's up too much, get rid of it, sure. Mm, yeah. And or paint that, over it. Sometimes it's that more when you're it. saying, oh, this is up to nothing. And then you're just about to throw it. And I say, ah, if I break this in half and put this in between, wow, look at that now. You know, whatever you make something yeah. else out of it, yeah, it becomes Re another found object. <laughs> yeah, another found object and another repurposing. I think yeah. that's a that's a lovely way of approaching yeah. these things. Yeah. There, but sometimes there is just the point where you just go, "I'm I need to get rid of this because it's just sapping my energy, and sure, you know, yeah. my energy is more important." I have also gone and destroyed things because of where I was at a journey, and I later regretted destroying them. Mm. Um, I. I you know, there was a, a very important religious phase in my life where suddenly my life was full of answers. And I think answers limit you, whereas mm -hmm. questions open up new things. And when your world becomes full of answers and you think you know things and you start arguing with other people, your life starts becoming very small. And I, I in those times, I have censored some of my work and I, I wish I hadn't, you know, mm -hmm. but that's all part of the journey as well. It is part of the journey, absolutely. Mm. It's been absolutely fascinating, Marcus. I think there's about another eight videos that we need to do. Yeah, we can do more, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'd be, I'd be happy the... to do this again. It's quite fun. Yeah, I've really, really enjoyed listening mm. to you. And I've learned so much more about your practice and, mm. you know, the journey. I love, I have to say, I'm always going to remember the rainbow that was actually from underneath mm. the toilet. I know. <laughs> That's it's, always going to stay with me. Just had to put it in a gold frame. <laughs> had to go in a gold frame. Yeah, that's going to stay with me uh, forever. And and the fact that you 
And that thing that literally what you just said about the fact that when we go in and we go tight and we start arguing and we think we know it all, mm. we limit and we become smaller. Mm. And when we're exactly. open to new ideas and mm. different ways of thinking and expression, mm. we come we become more than ourselves. The question is an open window. The answer is a closed door. Mm. Mm. In essence, you know, of course, we need yeah. some answers in order to you know, make things functional. But in order to grow as people, as artists, as creative individuals, we definitely have to ask questions. That's where mm. the lifeblood is. Mm. Asking, be curious, mm. yeah. stay curious, people. That's mm. what this whole series is about, mm. is the curiosity. Mm. It's the mm. asking and unraveling and unwrapping. Mm. And just so some people who might be struggling will get inspiration from it. Mm. So no, thank you so much. Mm. I have thoroughly enjoyed chatting to you marcus thank you very much it's been Me brilliant too. Me too. and uh, i love your i love your work and i love your the, his, the historical and the journey all the pieces it's just amazing mm -hmm. and thank you everyone for watching and asking thank your you. questions mm -hmm. it's been I'll brilliant i'll be going to the facebook yeah. and having a we'll go over there. to facebook and if you've got any questions then you know tag marcus and he'll answer mm -hmm. your questions mm -hmm. and that thread will be there for always and then in the next few days caitlin will get this up onto youtube and this will be available for everyone to to re-watch but it's always in crowdcast you can always come back here mm -hmm. and watch it in here again thank you so much thank you to tessa our able assistant mm -hmm. yes indeed. in all of this and you know where to go if you want to contact marcus either mm -hmm. to his website or go to the magazine on the Pure Arts Group uh, website and find his contact details. Until the next live, which I think the next live is on Monday, and that's with Ollie Holman, who also works in a lot of found objects as well, and 3D. So I think that's going to be fascinating. So yeah, it's going to be great. Thank you so much, Marcus. Thank I'll you, Leslie. Talking to you again Talk very soon. soon. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, thank you everyone for watching and we'll be back live on Monday. Bye-bye.